from Berlin. Um, I'm the director of the German Council on Foreign Relations, DEAP, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to tonight's discussion. We will focus on Europe's capacity to act in the global tech race. Uh, and later on this evening, we will discuss a report which uh, colleagues of mine, a colleague and a former colleague of mine, uh, have just published on precisely this issue. And I would like to seize this opportunity to thank Microsoft, uh, with whose support this project was only possible. So tonight we will present a very interesting program. We will start out with a view from Portugal. Uh, we have the uh, Secretary of State for Digital Transition of the Republic of Portugal with us, uh, the current Council Presidency of the European Union. I wish to warmly welcome Andre Azevedo uh, for his introductory remarks, which will essentially uh, inform us about the priorities of the Portuguese EU presidency. And then I will engage uh, in a discussion with uh, Thomas Ilves, who of course is known to you, but whom I will introduce in just uh, a few minutes. So I would like to hand the floor directly over to uh, the Secretary of State. Please, warm welcome, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Let me start by thanking to the German Council on Foreign Relations for inviting me to do the opening remarks of the report launch and discussion on Europe's capacity to act in the global tech race. I would also like to greet my dear fellow panelists and in particular Mr. Thomas Hills, former president of the Republic of Estonia. Um, as you are aware, Portugal has the current EU Council presidency and we are totally aware of the importance of the digital area, as well as the role Europe must play to be a relevant actor in the global tech race. Therefore, the Portuguese presidency of the European Union is fully committed with three main priorities in terms of digital agenda. The first one being the digital transition. We need to accelerate the digital transition as an engine of eco economic recovery and as the engine of development of a new and safe technologies, infrastructures and connectivity, and as the backbone of Europe's leadership on the digital ecosystem. The second priority is about digital empowerment, about skills. We need to empower our citizens through investment in education, training and lifelong learning and business enforcing a robust, fair and competitive economy and ensuring a safe, neutral digital environment that empowers growth and development. And finally, the third priority is about digital democracy. We must reinforce Europe, the, the role of Europe as a beacon of digital democracy. We need to promote and support the European digital sovereignty and to promote e-government solutions for the 21st century. Having in mind these three prior priorities and following the 2030 roadmap, we want to ensure three main goals or areas of focus during our presidency, which we are already do doing because the, in fact, the presidency started in 1st January, 2021. The first one is about the importance of the entrepreneurship agenda. Europe can sometimes still be perceived as the old continent and unable to fully reap the benefits from cutting edge technologies. In order to become a digital force, we need to change this perception radically. The time has come to level up our game in supporting the most relevant contributors to economy diversification and the innovation, which are the startups and the entrepreneurs ecosystem. They are in fact the heart of economic growth and so we cannot continue with our current fragmented approach to entrepreneurship. Europe currently has no strong and robust data regarding the startup ecosystem, the incubators and accelerators network and the investors network. We need to be, have a much stronger and distinctive branding on the role that Europe wants to position and be perceived international and to build awareness and eminence on a strong European startup market. It is therefore no coincidence that Europe is somehow unable to attract and retain our startups at the global level. So we need to change this radically and therefore during our presidency and on the European Council that we dedicated during the, the digital day on 19 March, we have, we, have, we have decided to focus our attention on startups. But this is not enough if we really want to take it to the next level. 
we must have more data at the European level and we need to create an European brand and to create incentives to attract and retain the most prominent startups in the world. Um, as it is also important that together with the, to, to emphasize that to, together with the European Commission, Portugal, uh, Portuguese government is investing and currently developing a new permanent structure for entrepreneurship. We call it the Europe Startup Nations Alliance, and it will be a new entity to be created very soon during 2021, which at the European scale and with the support of the European Commission, will promote the entrepreneurship agenda, seeking to guarantee better alignment between all the member states, namely through the compliance with the startup nation standards that were set out in the referred declaration. Uh, but obviously being relevant in the digital world means more than investing in startups and in the entrepreneurship ecosystem. This must be seen as a part of a much higher purpose. And uh, we are all aware that there is no market without trust and the digital market is no exception. So we need to position Europe as, and its European way of doing business as the next stage of technology development that includes growth in a sustainable, ethical and cooperative way. At the same time, being digital cross-border by nature and to really bring Europe to the forefront of digital innovation, we need to reinforce and nurture international cooperation and strengthen our partnership with other like-minded countries. We do believe just like 24% 24, 24 of the people who fulfill the survey shown in the report that this international cooperation is extremely relevant. Therefore, we need to contribute to Europe's geostrategic affirmation as a space of security, trust and balance between economic development and ethical principles while striking at the same time meaningful and trustful partnerships with other continents like South America and Africa and also the private sector. We must bear in mind that being successful in a digital world means having this intersection conception about partnership with the private sector. This is not just a problem of public policies or state policies. We need to interact and be able to partnership with all these entities and all these stakeholders. Uh, in turbulent times, we also believe that the world is looking to Europe as a world reference. Therefore, as a guidance to shine light on the path we need to take, one of the most visible and symbolic actions of the Portuguese presidency will be the signature in Lisbon of a digital democracy with a purpose declaration and the associated framework of citizens' rights in the digital age, which in our view, it is critical to start a discussion on this matter. In fact, we don't have a charter of digital of fundamental digital rights at the European level or at the world level. And we believe that this is the momentum for us to kick off this process and start and give a, a strong contribution because we need to make sure that fundamental rights also are covered and are valid in a digital world. So we need to enhance the applicability of fundamental rights in this digital world and to contribute to the gathering of the applicable legislation, but most of all, to promote internationally the, what we call the, the European way of doing business. This is in fact our strongest asset, the, the, the trustful that is associated with this way, European way of doing business. And we believe we should promote it in a better way. So in our view, Europe sh should set an international standard on this matter, as we did with the general data protection regulation, being in the front line. In fact, also in the survey, 39% rated that regulatory policy is extremely important to shape Europe's capacity to act at the European Union level. So we believe we must ensure that we are dealing with the single world, where the same rules are applicable in the digital and in the physical world. This, this next set of legislation must guarantee that we are putting order into chaos, to use the already famous wording from the uh, European Commission. And the European legislative process is very, we are aware that is very complex, but we must find the common framework uh, to reach the, the necessary consensus. It is important to be ambitious, but we also need to be pragmatic 
So otherwise, we won't reach the, the necessary consensus on this topic. Uh, hopefully, we, are, we will also be able to achieve this purpose with the new proposal of AI regulation. This is a great example where we are being able to converge into this common framework on AI topics. And further, the idea to have different stakeholders, companies, NGOs, academia, civil society and third countries involved, we believe that it is of paramount importance to join the spirit and the principles of this declaration and to put the focus on the importance of protecting digital uh, fundamental rights in the digital uh, era. Uh, so we also would like this declaration, this Lisbon declaration to be signed by third parties, countries and by the private sector on our event that will take place in Lisbon on June the 1st. And finally, and as a last area of, of focus, I would like to underline that the importance of a stronger European Union approach to digital connectivity that will also contribute to the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Telecommunications and ICT are, as we all know, key instruments to enable and accelerate social, economic, digital and environmentally sustainable growth and development for everyone, including, of course, the uptake of green ICT in partner countries and regions. The inauguration of the submarine cable, the yellow link, that will tie Europe to South America during our, during our presidency is a great example of this collaboration and this um, network of connectivity of data a shared market that we need to implement. If the European Union doesn't secure its international connectivity, it takes the risk of becoming an island in a digital ocean. But please bear in mind that for these projects to succeed, we need to ensure that they are done at the European level rather than being a parallel initiative of two or three countries. On this subject, we promoted during our presidency the European Data Gateway Platform Strategy, which was signed by 26 member states plus Norway and Iceland. And this declaration is a call to action to undertake a full assessment of the current submarine cable system, systems in the European Union and to list and rank according to their expiry the international connectivity systems that will reach the end of their lifetime in the upcoming years. So we need to identify new international connectivity infrastructures that will assure sufficient capacity and resilience and furthermore, provide competitive advantage to the European Union, among others. I'm finishing. Let me finish by reaffirming this. We must position Europe as the world's trustworthy digital partner. This is the value proposition that will distinguish, distinguish us from other geographies. This is the time to move forward. Thank you very much for this opportunity to share this, this vision. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary of State Azevedo. It was a great pleasure having you. Um, we know that you have to leave us immediately for next appointment. So we really appreciate that you took the time tonight to share those views. Um, and um, I will now directly switch to my conversation uh, with Thomas Silvis. Um, you already mentioned in him in your introductory remarks and it is a great pleasure indeed, Thomas, to have you here with us tonight. As former president of Estonia and one of the, I would say, early movers on uh, digitization, uh, your voice and your views on, on the topics that we are dealing with is, of course, much appreciated. Um, and I, I just quote uh, Secretary of State Azevedo, who, who says that with regards to digital entrepreneurship, Europe sometimes look as it looks like an old continent. That may be true, but I don't think it does so for, for Estonia. Uh, which you led as president from the year 2006 to 2016. Now you work at Stanford University and you have very many other roles, uh, for instance, at the World Economic Forum, heading a working group on blockchain and many other affiliations and jobs. So um, I would like to start by, by asking you, as a, as a reaction to what we just heard, there's a clear ambition on the side of uh, the Portuguese uh, EU presidency uh, to move ahead with a digital agenda. But my question to you would be, stepping back from the three priorities, we'll come to them in a minute. Um, where is Europe in this race between China and the US uh, with uh, a need to, to really uh, catch up really in this, in this process? 
how would you evaluate uh, both Europe's views on its own strength and where it has to go and its actual capacity to move ahead? Well, already in 2019, the top 20 IT companies in the world, 14 were American and six were Chinese. There were no European companies in the top 20 IT companies. Um, and uh, <laughs> I hate to know where they are now. Um, and I think we are in a lot of trouble for a lot of reasons and which uh, you cannot necessarily remedy with things directly approaching digi sort of digital, whatever you want to do. Uh, first of all, the culture of entrepreneurship in Europe. Uh, in uh, Europe, 80% of uh, financing is from banks and 20% from private equity. It's the opposite in the United States. Uh, you can imagine, well, the picture I usually paint is uh, a guy with long hair who has, this is a true story, but I won't mention his name, but a guy with long hair who has said he does not believe in bathing. But in what's not true is he walks into Deutsche Bank and he says, oh, I had this idea. It's a personal computer. He will be thrown out of that bank within 30 seconds in 1975. In 1975, Steve Jobs built Apple with private equity. I mean, this is the difference. And this is why the, this is why, I mean, I have too many stories of this. Uh, when I was president, this kid came in, I had invited a kid to come drink tea with me because he was had just graduated university and he had gotten $300,000 for his little startup. And so I'd like to help him. I would like to invite people like that. And I was talking to him, he was 22 years old. And I uh, said, well, what do you want to do? And he goes, well, I'm sorry to tell you, Mr. President, in, in two weeks, I'm moving to the United States. And I said, why is that? He said, there's no point in being here. You can't get money and there's, it's a fragmented market. Uh, six months later, he had raised $6 million. Uh, four years later, he sold his company for $100 million. I mean, this is the problem of Europe. In, I mean, in the, I mean, and there are so many cases of the of this, and you know, we have all these incubators all over. I'm sorry, the state secretary is gone, but I remember discussing this with someone from Portugal, and he said, "Yes, all are, oh, I know." Neely Cruz told me she had been in Portugal, and all of the the wonderful um, incubators they have there, every single one of them. As soon as as soon as our idea works, and we're going to the U.S. This, I mean, so our environment is already non-competitive. And I spent, I'm no longer at Stanford, I'm back in Estonia, but at Stanford, you, I mean, there was an entire Estonian community there, not to mention all of the Germans and the French and, <laughs> and all of these Europeans working at all of these companies or, or with their own companies. Uh, I mean, sort of, it was, it was amazing and it was depressing. So we do have not created the environment in Europe that actually would allow the startup culture to flourish. And even EU regulation funding has been, uh, has gone in the wrong direction until I understand recently, because the whole idea of a startup is that if you, you can change your idea when you realize, you know, that's how we got penicillin. You know, Fleming was studying, <laughs> Fleming was studying <laughs> bacteria and he was cursing these molds that kept growing on his Petri dishes until he said, oh, wait a minute, that's pretty interesting. The mold is killing the bacteria. Well, that's, it, we would not fund if Fleming, when he discovered penicillin had said, no, no, okay, forget all these bacteria. I mean, forget my grant to study bacteria. I've discovered mold can kill bacteria. The EU would have said, we're cutting your funding and pay back what we already gave you. This is not the way you do innovation. So this is, so we have a, we have a huge brain drain because the entrepreneurial environment here 
is not conducive to digital innovation. And that, as I said, this has nothing to do with whatever wonderful programs we can come up with in the EU for digital. It's the environment, it's the environment. And, I, and I'm not, that's a cultural issue. I'm not sure how to do that, but certainly there might be some legislative tweaks that we, or legislative moves that we can make that would make venture capital, private equity uh, more welcome here because there's very little private equity here. Now, looking at the, looking at the broader picture, um, uh, I listened to a really brilliant paper by Kieran Martin, who is now at Oxford, but was head of security at GCHQ, basically arguing that the battle we have is between a liberal democratic world in technology that includes Europe and the United States, obviously, against a, an author, algorithmic authoritarianism that we have led by China. I don't see Russia as a player in this at all. It's Europe, the United States, and China. And his argument was, and I agree completely, that unless those of us who espouse liberal values and all of the all of the things that enable us to live in liberal democracy, rule of law and everything else. Instead of focusing our efforts on screwing GAFA, which seems to be the primary effort of, of the European Union, I'm no fan of GAFA. I hate every one of those. Well, Apple I like because they actually pay attention to privacy, but GAFA, I don't like GAFA. But that does not mean, I mean, but that's not the raison d'etre of the European Union is to screw them. And I think what we really need is at this point, much stronger cooperation with the United States, and which is now possible again, uh, on technical tech, on technology and digital issues. Uh, instead, we have been focusing on being protectionist, which is clearly something that does not work in technology. Protectionist, I mean, especially, I mean, not only on the specific technology, but in, but having this attitude that we are against the Americans. The one area where we can compete and where we should compete uh, if we had a more principled attitude on protectionism <laughs> would be 5G, where we, we I mean, I, I asked this question last year, the last event I went to before COVID was the München uh, Sicherheits Conference. And then the, the Secretary of Defense of Trump's uh, was there and he was saying, you people, Europeans, you can't take Chinese, you can't take Chinese. I stood up and I said, Mr. Secretary, um, what are you gonna do about it? I mean, we do have Ericsson and Nokia, but they're not subsidized the way Huawei is. Are you going to subsidize us? And he said, well, that's a very difficult question. Um, I mean, the thing is we actually do have two technological leaders and, uh, the, and those two companies, if we found some way of supporting them, and I think that's, uh, I mean, we, I think we should work with the US on supporting them, especially after the findings that were in, I guess, Volkskrantz last week, about basically the, I mean, use Huawei just basically <laughs> penetrating everything that was using Huawei technology. I think we should be even more scared of what the Chinese will do with Huawei just because of the nature of 5G, which is that it's no longer a strictly hardware, but a hardware plus software technology that can be modified added from a distance at any time. So even if you take the technology and say, oh, it's all right, then you know, five hours from now they can switch and change the, the software in order to monitor what you're doing. So I think that Europe really does need to take, be a participant in a protectionist enterprise on 5G, but protectionist that includes basically the United States, Canada and other liberal democracies. So, Australia, New Zealand, I don't know. Um, on AI, with the departure of the UK, we lost the third player in AI. I mean, we as Europe lost the third player because basically it was 
the U.S. number one, a close second was, uh, was China, of course, and then a third, not as big, but nonetheless uh, sort of serious contender was the U.K., and, and Europe is not really in there. So AI is again an area where I think we need to work with both the UK and the United States. And I think that AI will be the, the main area of contention and defense and security in the future. Um, I can send you a great uh, discussion with Eric Schmidt uh, on this, who, had, who headed the uh, US digital security AI commission with business, government, and so forth. Um, but I mean, certainly the US sees AI as the primary battlefield for, uh, for security and defense, and we should too, but we don't. Um, Thomas, can one I just area where we're, what? Thomas, may I interrupt you on this sentence, we should, but we don't. Um, very true. I mean, there are many reports that establish this grim picture, which you, you have painted with your own experience and observations. And just to comment briefly on the this innovative system that we have in Europe and what you said about the funding is not available. On that piece alone, uh, with the concept of capital markets union, the EU has ideas how to create a deeper capital market, but we don't, don't move on. So my question to you, going back to the field of, of digitization and technology with your deep political experience, um, wh what could happen to make the EU move more quickly on the challenges that you just mentioned? Do you see any way forward or are we just stuck? And okay, we have an ambitious Portuguese presidency. They put forward three priorities, but in your view, will anything happen? Or are we, you know, are we blind? Regarding those scaring things. people, <laughs> scaring people. <laughs> I mean, the uh, to under, you know, it's not all bad. I mean, I my other experience is that while in the United States, uh, I was in the middle of Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. and in a twelve-kilometer radius, I had the headquarters of Tesla, Apple, Google, Facebook, Palantir, YouTube. 12 kilometers all around me. Wonderful. They create all these great things. When I wanted to register my child to go to school, I had to take a photocopy of my electricity bill, drive to the local school headquarters with my visa, with my passport visa and DS 2019 form, which is the academic. It's some, if you're an academic, you need that too. And I sat there for half an hour while a woman copied out by hand all of my data. That's how you register. This is 1950s. Um, so on the public service side, we can actually move ahead quite a bit because we have the ADOS directive, which is important. Not always implemented, but the ADOS, uh, uh, you know, we, we have, we have the, digital the Digital Services Act, which I mean, all this is going too slowly. We could do a lot. I'm not saying that we're powerless. We can, on the, on the public services side, we could do huge things, which would really make Europe a powerhouse. Um, yeah, I mean, the example I would bring is that, you know, it took me 10 years to get it so that Finns can come to Estonia and take out their digital prescriptions in Estonia by inserting their card into any, any pharmacy in the country and it should work the other way, but doesn't because the Finns aren't compatible. But the things we should just work all over the EU. You know, any place you go, if you need your prescription, you go to any pharmacy, ID yourself and you have a, a health record should be the same. All of these digital services should be working cross border, but the is going so slowly. I mean, that's where we're good. We're good on public services. We're good on regulation. Um, and, but we don't see that um, moving too much along. I would see an, as another stumbling block, European obsession with privacy. I have nothing against privacy, but in fact, privacy is just that someone can see your data. 
but no one really has given any concern I see politically or legislatively to data integrity, which is that someone can change your data, which is far worse than someone just publishing your data, but there's no discussion. And so um, we, we, we get stuck on these sort of obsessive things. And if you, I mean, I just read the press and I go, no, 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 this is the wrong thing to focus on. Uh, and then of course, politicians take up what's read and what's in the press and it goes on. Um, but we can move ahead. We just need greater political will. There is one more area that I would raise and then, well, two areas. One is that um, on a broader level, the, and this is for your area too, it's that the, I, Warfare and security has been a kinetic issue since the since pre hominids. You know, rocks, bows and arrows, missiles, it's all force equals mass times acceleration. As of 2007, in practical terms, but since the turn of the century, uh, force no longer equals mass times acceleration, and acceleration is time is, is distance divided by time squared. Our, our vulnerabilities to digital attacks, to we've seen from Stuxnet, we've seen from the 2007 DDoS attack on my country, which shut it down basically for a couple of days. From, uh, from the blackouts in Ukraine uh, that we've seen repeatedly, uh, I mean, all of the, I mean, we are now living in an era in which digitally we are incredibly vulnerable to, to what before was only in the kinetic realm. The positive side of that is that Europe is actually in a good position to work in that. I mean, in the EU is probably far better for that than NATO, which is not very good at dealing with security in the digital environment, whereas we already have structures such as ENISA, uh, we have, I mean, we have strong cooperation between certs across countries. The Europe, instead of focusing on PESCO, I would advise to create a strong digital security uh, environment, and it has the capacity to do that. And um, can I pick you up on that point? Because you, you said two things earlier. You said we need to scare people. Uh, and Russia's no player. <laughs> However, in this area of cybersecurity and the threat that you've just described, Russia definitely is. And now if we look at what happened uh, just a few, well, basically a week ago, uh, the US administration uh, sanctioned Russia for the SolarWinds hack. And uh, it had also announced that it would do cyber exercises, but not with the whole of the EU, but France and Denmark, the UK and Estonia. So would you say that the EU is making a strategic mistake not to be more forward-leaning as an EU 27 in this? And where do you see transatlantic relations and the challenge that Europe has and Germany has to deal with Russia in, in the cyber uh, area, but also, of course, as a neighbor? Well, I mean, the only reason tiny little Estonia is there is because <laughs> we just do this a little better. I mean, we, I mean, be, since we were already good in digital, we were, that was the vulnerability that was attacked. And since that was the vulnerability that was attacked 14 years ago, we have put an especially big effort into cybersecurity. So that's where that comes from. But really the countries that are involved are the ones that have been most active in cybersecurity. I mean, and here even, you know, I mean, when you have Thomas Ridd, a German, uh, the, one of the leading experts on cybersecurity in the world, he's in Johns Hopkins. I mean, that's, again, because the, the environment for do, pursuing those things is better there. Um, and, we, and that's why in Europe, we need to have a much greater focus on cyber, on, on cyber security thinking of security as 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 something that today is much more digital than it ever was and i would go a step further with the disappearance of distance and time 
as an element in, in security, NATO becomes less important. Not to us, because we still live right next to bad people, but uh, because kinetic warfare can still be applied. But in but it broadens the it broadens the network of allies, because it doesn't make any difference if you are digitally attacked in Tallinn, Estonia, Berlin, Germany, or Osaka, Japan. It makes no difference. It's microseconds difference in terms of the effect. So, I mean, I think we can move, I mean, so NATO, where digital has, re, has eliminated the dependence upon distance that you have in security up till the new millennium. You know, it doesn't matter anymore how many tanks you have and it doesn't matter fly, fighter range, bomber capacity, all of that th nuclear throw weight, of course, all of that, remains as an element, but we can think in different terms. And I would certainly love to see Europe take a far more forward-leaning position on digital security as something that unites liberal democracies, regardless of geography. It does not have to be just the EU, but the EU is in a very strong position to move ahead even within the EU because of the legal and regulatory frameworks, as well as real institutions that we have created that is, are far more than what NATO has done. Because NATO, you know, NATO is not big on cooperation, EU is. And the last thing I would say where we can do something, which again has nothing to do with digital, but does, has everything to do with digital. And that is um, take a serious look at, um, at visas. I mean, why, I mean, you know, Microsoft CEO and Google CEO are not born in the United States. Um, you know, and they're both from the Indian subcontinent. Um, if you're in Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley is full of people from outside the United States and they have come there to study and then they stay and then there's a whole lot of other people who come there with what in the US is called an H-1B visa, which makes it very easy for tech companies to hire people from outside the US which otherwise is not easy to enter. I mean, but it's the H-1B visa program and the openness to students from outside the US is what has made Silicon Valley actually what it is. I mean, we don't have to focus on Silicon Valley. I don't like the notion, but in any case, we need to open up Europe to students in STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, to people from the subcontinent, from Africa, from Latin America. There's so many talented people all over and we have to get them to want to come here and not the United States. But in fact, it is, I mean, I know that it's rather, most countries, it's rather difficult to, to come to study or to work. It's a long procedure. Mm -hmm. And so we need to get, you know, when we talk about, you know, helping the global South, well, where we can help the global south is to give them educational opportunities which are much more much greater than they have there i mean that's what i would do frankly okay. but that's me thank you thomas that was a fascinating almost half hour uh was Sorry. a tour d'horizon the stakes for europe in this global competition for tech leadership and digitization um I would now like to invite Tyson Barker, my colleague who directs our tech uh, and global affairs program uh, to take over. He will introduce, first of all, the study that he has co-authored with a former colleague who is now at the German Foreign Office for precisely uh, technology and digitization issues. Um, and then Tyson will lead a panel discussion on the study. So Thomas, if you accept to stay with us, we'd be very oh, yeah, pleased I'm very, to I'm have very you. Interested in this. As Thank you can you. tell, this is an obsession of mine. Yes. <laughs> Europe is behind. Big thanks for joining us. Um, Tyson, over to you. Thanks so much, Daniela. And um, 
Uh, you, uh, Mr. President, and, and the Secretary of State put a lot of things on the table. I couldn't help but nod along and think about the fact that a majority of startups founded in Silicon Valley are founded either by immigrants or the children of immigrants. So uh, it really does draw from the world and that magnet is a, is a great source of strength for the United States. Um, I am delighted to introduce uh, one of our main events tonight, uh, the study or the person who's going to introduce the study, my co-author Khan Sahin. And Khan is the emblem of what we all would like to do in think tank land, namely have big thoughts in think tanks, write interesting reports, and then go into government and try to implement them. Uh, Khan is now, as, as Daniela mentioned, was a uh, research fellow at the German Council on Foreign Relations and is now technology fellow and CATS fellow at the policy planning unit of the German Federal Foreign Office. So I'm gonna give it to Khan uh, to introduce the study and then we're gonna have a panel discussion. Khan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tyson. Thank you very much, Daniela. Thank you very much, uh, President Ilves. Um, I'm very delighted to uh, present um, our study, Europe's Capacity to Act in a Global Tech Race. Um, and before I present the study, just a little disclaimer today, I will speak not in the capacity as a technology fellow at the policy planning unit of the German Foreign Office, but in the capacity as a former research fellow at uh, the German Council on Foreign Relations. And um, we should start with the next slide. Thank you very much, Julia. In the study, in the report, we have identified five key trends uh, which show basically the urgency to act for Europe's in a global tech race. And the first trend is increased competitiveness or to be more precise, the increased role that technologies play for economic and military and geopolitical competition. And against the spectrum of governments and companies that are able to achieve mastery of key technologies will have enormous economic and political power levers at their disposal. The second trend is the so-called technological or digital decoupling trend. And when taken to its logical conclusion, it would basically mean that to decoupling would lead to two separate IT stacks, tech stacks, given the current situation, one led by the US and the other, other one by China, and each tech stack would have its own supply chain network, its own standards and protocols. And even though the emergent, emergence of a full-fledged decoupling is not realistic and feasible in the foreseeable future, um, it has, of course, um, uh, it has, of course, an impact on Europe's strategic orientation. The third trend is COVID-19 fueled dependencies and vulnerabilities. Uh, in the technological realm, uh, for instance, um, during the COVID-19 crisis, we have now the widespread tech adoption throughout Europe, which has intensified its reliance on US web services and cloud hosting providers. Four, we have the renaissance of industry policies worldwide. <laughs> of course, China is a front runner in terms of that, but even the US, even the Biden administration right now is preparing more government focused support for its innovation industrial base. And also when it comes to Europe, um, we have the European Union itself, but also major EU member states such as France and Germany, who have ramped up its industry policy efforts with a focus on tech. And last but not least, we have also the trend of digital authoritarianism, uh, which basically means that countries such as China are increasingly using technologies such as AI surveillance to suppress citizens, to grade citizens, but also suppress minorities and also export these technologies, but not only the technologies, also the values surrounding these technologies to other countries all over the world. Against the spectrum, of course, uh, we can see there is an urgency to act for Europe. And therefore, in this study, the concept of EU's capacity to act at a global tech race is put forward in order to describe the EU state and further prospects in the digital age, or at least as an interpretation for digital sovereignty, which is basically the best word, buzzword right now for describing the interface of international politics and technologies in the European context. And the study aims to provide a comprehensive assessment of Europe's capacity to act in the digital realm using a mix of quantitative and qualitative research methods. If we go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, we have asked stakeholders, experts, 
on technology digital policies in the European context. And we have asked many questions. We got many findings. You can find them all in our report. Um, we just want to highlight two of those questions. Um, we asked, how should the European Union position itself in the US-China tech confrontation? Interestingly, 46% said move closer to the US. 54% said they should remain, stay, become independent. And 0% said we should move closer to China. And for me personally, this is a very interesting finding, particularly in the context of the recent calls by US American and European decision makers in government and in industry, which calls for a new tech alliance between Brussels and Washington, also as an answer to address China's increased tech competitiveness globally. If we move to the next, if we can move, thank you very much. We also asked, how would you rate the following critical technology areas by degree of importance for the EU's innovation industrial base and capacity to act independently, with one being less important and five most important? And we can see AI and 5G are here the clear winner. Uh, one interpretation is that in the last two or three years, uh, it seems like that we have discussed mostly about AI and 5G among the five um, technology areas in the European context. We can also argue that maybe quantum technologies is not seen as important as AI or 5G because it's still in the early stages. And I personally, I wonder how the survey uh, would have turned out uh, in terms of semiconductors if we had only asked American stakeholders nowadays. If we move to the next slide, thank you very much. Besides the stakeholder survey, we took also a deeper look at uh, we took a deeper look at five key technology areas to provide an overview of the field and to give also practical recommendations for the European Union, um, so that the European Union can push forward in each area. And beginning with AI, we could see that Europe has its strength. It has a comparatively solid research base. It has its strength when it comes to industrial data-based AI applications but it has also its weaknesses, its sticking points, which hinder Europe's catch up um, in the AI, in the global AI race. Um, for instance, um, Europe has always the inability to commercialize its good AI re research. We have a lack of access to venture capital as also President Ulvis mentioned beforehand. And we recommend for instance, that the European Union and its member states should push towards a broad open data mandate because for AI applications you need quantity and the quality of data to unify currently distinct public data pools. And we also say that the public sector should be a role model by adopting AI-based processes. Coming to cloud computing, the European Union is lagging far behind US players such as Microsoft or Amazon. Um, but the European Union and its member states, they have, they have conducted some countermeasures. Um, they have um, started some initiatives, first and foremost Gaia-X, which aims at increasing Europe's competitiveness in that field, um, and which aims at creating a cloud-based infrastructure on European standards. And for these initiatives, like Gaia-X to succeed, we, see it, we say that they need to focus on value add for customers and they should also focus on creating uh, the European Union a level playing field, for instance, lowering market barriers for startups in Europe. When it comes to 5G, um, we have already heard that Europe, Europe has a good global positioning here due to Ericsson and Nokia. They are directly competing with um, Huawei and ZTE. And um, we know the uh, controversial 5G debate and um, against this backdrop, we recommend that the EU should look for ways to tighten its coordinated approach. Um, the 5G toolbox was a very good beginning, but I think it is very important to have a coordinated, we think it's very important to have a coordinated approach to avoid further fragmentation. And we also recommend that Europe should support open standards. The open RAN discussion is, uh, very hot right now. Um, and um, while this might weaken the position of major EU players compared to the US, we think it will strengthen the EU compared to China and enable more competition, also in terms of 6G. Quantum computing, the technology is still in early stages. Um, Europe has a strong research base, but also has problems to commercialize its research. Um, we 
uh, demands an uh, overarching quantum strategy focused on enabling development of technology that we also argue that we have national initiatives, but we need also here a coordinated EU approach in order to compete with the big players in the US and China. And in order to help this commercialization process, we should also enable public-private partnerships. Last but not least, semiconductors. We can clearly say the European Union has no top tire, has no top tire semiconductor fabrication. It is very much lagging behind the cutting edge dominant players in the semiconductor production from the US, um, Taiwan and South Korea. We say we should preserve our few current chip production capabilities. We should support also growing local manufacturing for all, especially in terms of entering um, the market of emerging new microprocessor applications. And we also say that European, Europe should promote open standards and chips design, which can help to level the playing field and reduce barriers for European companies to enter the market. And when we go to the next slide, just, um, um, just very overall recommendations for EU foreign policy in terms of the interface of uh, technology and geopolitics. Europe should maintain a globally interoperable internet and innovation system as a high objective, since it has benefited from it economically and it's totally in line with European values. Second, it should lead in the development of international coalitions with like-minded actors and standard setting bodies and informal groupings for technology governance, for instance, when it comes to 6G. It should incorporate the global thoughts in, into a strategy that fuels development, connectivity and regional empowerment, since we also think that the European Union has neglected the global thought when it comes to that interface of technology and international politics. And last but not least, even though it was not a focus of our study, we say that the European Union should address the role that military and defense modernization can play in advancing Europe's innovation industrial base. Here you can download the full report here and now I'm very much looking forward to the panel discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Khan. That was a perfect uh, summary of the report and being one of the co-authors, I know that it took a lot to, to encapsulate it in about seven minutes, but you did excellent. Now we're gonna go to the, um, the panel discussion and we have a really great group of panelists from all walks of life in Europe's digital, uh, digital world. Uh, we have Alejandro uh, Cainzos, who is a member of the cabinet of uh, Vice President Margaret Vestager. Uh, responsible for her international portfolio. Um, so we will definitely hear about a lot of the action that's been happening this week on artificial intelligence, but also in the digital decade. Uh, then we have Alexandra Giese, who is a member of the European Parliament for the Greens uh, and sits on the Special Committee for Artificial Intelligence, as well as is the shadow rapporteur for the Greens for the Digital Services Act. Uh, from here in Berlin, uh, a, a kind of counterpart from the other side of the aisle, we have uh, Andreas Steyer, who is a member of the German Bundestag from the CDU, uh, who is a member of the Enquete Commission for AI and is one of the few uh, members of the Bundestag who is actually an engineer. So he's not only a policymaker, but also a practitioner. So has, has some insight uh, that some of us who do political science maybe don't have. Um, then we have uh, Guido Brinkel, who is the head of regulatory policy at Microsoft Germany. So I'm going to start by asking uh, each of you guys a question, um, and then we'll, we'll open it up for a little bit of discussion. Uh, Alejandro, let me start with you. Um, you know, we've ha heard a lot of talk about uh, more industrial policy, this revolution in industrial policy, investing more in key em enabling technologies. There's this new big fund, um, the Re Recovery and Resilience Fund has a big portion set aside for, for digital transformation. But at the end of the day, and this kind of played out in our survey as well, um, it all comes back to the Brussels effect. Um, i.e. the size of the uh, European market, market access, and the role of Europe as a global regulator. Um, and maybe nothing is more emblematic than uh, the announcement yesterday around artificial intelligence, uh, which was very well received, uh, also internationally, but is still the way that Europe's digital identity, identity is perceived globally. 
So um, when you're talking to your counterparts in Washington or in uh, Tokyo or in Israel, uh, are you guys talking about innovation or is it just about this regulatory stuff? Well, first of all, <clears throat> thanks a lot for, for inviting me. And, and it's, it's hard to follow on the excellent intervention so far. Uh, and, and, and congratulations on the report. It, it, it's really, really insightful. And I think for us, very helpful uh, for our own thinking, um, including on industrial policy, by the way, as, as the, the updated strategies about we're about to, to adopt. Um, to come back to your question, uh, innovation versus regulation, well, it's both. Why choose? Um, the truth is that, um, you know, you, you mentioned this, this buzzword of uh, digital sovereignty. Um, well, my boss always says we don't want to regulate, but we don't know how to do. Um, the idea is, <clears throat> is that um, in order to be sovereign, you need to, you need to be able to choose. Um, and we want these decisions to be made in our European democracies um, about the kind of digital economy and society we want to be. And in order to be able to choose, you need to have alternatives. And in situations where you have one-sided dependencies or single supplier dependencies in technology, then you obviously don't have a choice. So in order to, to be sovereign, you need to have some capacities. Uh, so that, there, that's where it comes to investment. And obviously, the, the regulation is, is fundamental um, in order to, to make sure that, uh, <clears throat> that individuals are, are empowered through things like privacy, but also um, that we can uh, uh, uphold the, the, the models of society that we want to have as technology develops and the, the, indeed the, the proposal on artificial intelligence that we issued um, uh, only yesterday is, is, is a very good example of that. So, so to answer your question, we do talk about both things uh, when we talk to our partners. Um, and, uh, and, and I think the, the recovery and resilience facility provides an, uh, an opportunity like we've never had before. Uh, we're talking about 20% uh, of the uh, minimum of 20% of the whole recovery fund, um, which is approximately 140 billion euros for the next two years for digitization. Uh, so, so, uh, if we ever had a chance to, to, to um, cut some of the lost terrain that has been described before now is, is definitely the time. Uh, thanks, Alejandro. Uh, maybe I can turn to uh, Ms. Giza. Um, you know, uh, yesterday, uh, after the announcement on artificial intelligence came out, the package, uh, Jake Sullivan tweeted his praise, which I think is pretty unique to have a national security advisor uh, tweeting praise of a European regulation. Um, but what struck me when I was reading the document, uh, looking at, you know, restrictions on uh, state action in real time remote uh, biometric identification, for example, or on social scoring, is it did seem to be much more inflected by things that are happening in China. Um, how much is the perception of a Chinese way of regulating technology starting to seep into the way that Brussels thinks about uh, the future of the, the global tech order? Well, that's definitely something we fear in Brussels because it's coming, it's becoming very clear that the Chinese government through artificial intelligence is not only trying, um, as somebody said before, to export its technology, but also its values along with that. And therefore, I think it's it's a very good thing that the European Commission came, for, came, came forward with a proposal on regulating artificial intelligence. So that does give us a chance to become a global standard setter at least, um, at least in terms of regulation, if not in terms of expertise, I think that's something we, we still need to work on. But I think that people who would say, well, you know, it's okay just to be allies with the United States and it's, it's not a serious issue to depend on US technology, do realize it would be a very, very serious issue to depend on Chinese technology. And I think if we want to continue to live in a free and democratic society, we need to get our act together because now it's the US companies that are dominating the technology market. But in 10 or 20 years, with all the backing from the government and, and public support, it might be Chinese uh, companies. So I think that does have an influence in Brussels, definitely. 
Yeah, I mean, it's definitely something to consider. The market access question, maybe that's something we can come back to in the second round, uh, you know, access for Chinese uh, tech companies within Europe, because it's definitely going to play a role in the future. It's a fault line. Um, Mr. Steyer, uh, you are here on this side, and we're about to get into the hot phase of uh, campaign, political campaign in Germany. Um, it's going to be a different era, clearly, and there's some new orientation around uh, Germany's uh, geostrategic and geotechnological um, orientation and positioning. Um, let me ask you, uh, the CDU hasn't released its platform yet. Um, you might be one of the shapers. Uh, if you are one of the shapers, or even if you weren't, what do you think should be some of the priorities that the CDU should take on for the next legislative period in the kind of international tech space? You're muted. So, thank you for the invitation. First of all, we need to be aware about where our strengths are and where our weaknesses are. And um, we have to break down it to uh, basically to all of our uh, industrial and business sectors. And uh, in Germany, there are still some uh, strong sectors like the automotive, like uh, the industry, like uh, the health system, uh, but we also have weaknesses, basically, what uh, Thomas uh, was presenting at the beginning of this discussion, uh, basically, in the, uh, when it comes to uh, yeah, consumer markets and so on, where uh, our culture is not, uh, not built up like the American culture is. Like, Americans are more uh, progressive in that way that they always look, okay, where's your opportunity? Where and how can we make, make money? And making money is not some, uh, something bad. It's more something where, uh, which is evaluated. And uh, so we have to be aware about where our strengths are and where, how we can proceed. And if you look at our, uh, basically on our uh, surrounding here in, in Germany, I think we have uh, quite good opportunities uh, when we develop our research opportunities when we look basically on our key technologies and uh, when we uh, basically uh, develop and try to find out uh, how we can develop them. If I look basically on some factors like AI, like quantum technology, or also like uh, cyber security, I can see some nucleus where we are still not that bad and uh, where we can still compete with uh, uh, our global uh, competitors like the United States or like uh, the uh, like China, but the main thing is what we need to be clear that we have to work out a plan on all these topics. And uh, when I look at AI, I think we made a certain progress in the last uh, years. Uh, we found it already 30 years ago. Uh, the DFKI at uh, DFKI in Germany which was a key factor basically for industry 4.0. And uh, now we have to look where are our constraints. And if you look at our constraints, I think we have to mention that our standards and regulation in some ways are really some uh, thing which narrows us down to a certain, uh, to a slower speed. And that's one key question. How can we uh, improve those things? And I'm also working in a, a, a standardization group here, which was founded in 2018, where uh, we try to figure out how can we improve our standards. Germany was uh, founded 100 years ago, the DEAN, uh, the German Institute for Standardization, and it was a key factor in order to compete on, on the global market that we in Germany was, uh, were setting standards and that people who know about the technology were st setting standards, not that we were uh, asking the legislative uh, to uh, certain to, to uh, build up strict regulations, but that we were using these groups and institutes where tech engineers, where the people who are working with the technology were developing these standards. And that's what we built out and rolled out on a national basis. And now the next step is, 
especially when it comes to a scaling factor that we need also to involve these uh, European standards, that we have a certain harmonization on European goals, because that's also one, uh, one constraint constraint for us here in Germany, the Germany, the German market has about 80 million people. If you compare to the American market with 300 million people or with China with over 1 billion people, then that's one thing where we have to think on a European base that we also have a scaling factor here. And I think that's the main issue where we need now to, to set up our thoughts here, which we made on a national basis that we now connect it to the European basic. If you talk in Germany about Dean, then we have to talk uh, on a European base on Sen Senelec, that we can build up also uh, regulation there. And with that, we also can build up our quality structure because Germany never won in the past that we were fast on every uh, business sector, but where we con convinced the market is that we were building products which had a certain quality standard and made in Germany was still a big selling factor. And if we can build up this also for AI and also the other key technologies, then I think it can come to a, a big rollout where also uh, we are able to compete on a, a global basis. Thanks so much for that. Uh, I, I think that that's a really important point and the geopolitics of technical standards is really raising on the global agenda. I mean, I, I've talked to people in the German government and they say that the capacity there, speaking of capacity to act, mm -hmm. the capacity in the private sector in Germany and in Europe is diminished. Uh, they, there isn't the level of participation in standard setting bodies that there used to be. And the Chinese are flooding the zone in places like the ITU, like ISO, with model standards. Uh, which is a product of a very complex situation, but has things to do with privatization, et cetera. Um, we'll, maybe we'll be able to come back to that, but I wanna to get to, uh, to Guido Brinkel. Um, uh, Mr. Steyer mentioned the idea of, you know, the trustworthiness, and that's definitely an issue that you're dealing with in kind of cloud computing uh, in other areas. Um, how does Microsoft see Europe's attempt to kind of or rewrite the rule book on, on cloud computing, is this, is this embraced by Microsoft or do they see this as a protectionist measure? Um, well, first of all, thanks for having me and thanks for the report, which is a very interesting piece um, um, and a very good read. Um, yeah, I mean, starting, starting with our, our general view from a, from a business perspective, looking at what we are facing here in Europe currently in, in terms of political debate that is driven by notions like digital sovereignty, trustworthiness, as you mentioned, and, and similar concept. I think the, the very basic answer is that we are totally aware that we have to deliver on this, you know, that we have to build in trustworthiness and that we have to build in serenity into products and into how we um, how we partner also with local companies and how we partner with our customers. I think when you when you speak about cloud, I think one thing is very important and um, this is often a bit forgotten from my perspective that when you when you when you're working in the cloud sector, you're basically partnering with your customers. This is very much how we understand our business. And this is very much how it is shaped in practice. When you talk about our business relations, for example, um, with, uh, with large automotive players like, like Volkswagen or also BMW. So what you need is a very close relationship to your customer and your customer simply has to trust you because he's putting data in your cloud center and this doesn't work if the customer doesn't trust you. So I think from a business perspective, the good thing is that um, the trust within this expectation that you see on the political uh, level is basically matched by the customer where, which, has, which has the very same trust within this expectation. So you have, a, you have an intrinsic business reason to build trust within this into your products. So this leads over to the more political expectations when you talk about digital serenity and, and similar notions that are more blurry. Because when, when we talk about digital serenity, of course, this is, 
less a strategy or even the regulatory concept as such, but it's more a label that that contains several very different aspects. So I think for us, the challenge currently is to when when we when we say we have to deliver on serenity to more like uh, less um, the shiver what digital serenity means from in, in terms of policy uh, policy expectation. And we're clearly seeing like at least five manifestations of digital serenity currently. One is one is a renaissance of um, industrial policy. This this is, is mentioned in the report as well. A second one is a clear focus on security, specifically in, uh, when it comes to critical infrastructures. Uh, a totally understandable notion that Europe wants to secure its own uh, uh, critical infrastructures. Um, a third one is is in a notion of lead by regulation. This is also being touched upon repeatedly in the, in the report. And this is something we'll surely come back to. This is what you see with GDPR and now with the DSA and the DMA and also the AI regulation. Then you have the more individual perspective of data sovereignty of the individual, which is actually the, the traditional uh, data protection concept. And then you have a more broader policy value debate, which is about promoting uh, European values in a broader sense and which has implications for the diplomatic scene. So the challenge for us is, or the, the, or the, the opportunity as well, to analyze this and think how we can build uh, this into our products. What can we offer and where do we need political support? And um, that's a discussion that we, that we currently have. In some areas, we can do um, a lot of things on our own. We can localize data centers. We can try to offer um, security measures. We can uh, change terms and conditions, things that we have done in the past and in the very recent past. Others are more complicated, just as a, as a, as a finishing word. When you look at the Schrems 2 decision, for example, that is, that is widely discussed in this context, here it is, it is very, it, it is more difficult to respond to this because it's actually not addressing our own behavior, but the Schrems 2 decision is basically a verdict about the law of a third country, in that case, state, state access rules in the US, which is something which we cannot directly influence. It's, and it's far more a political topic and therefore it needs a political solution. Schrems 2 is the gift that keeps on giving in the transatlantic tech relationship. And, uh, and we'll, we, we're definitely having this conversation right now. Um, Privacy Shield will be the real test case for uh, how the Biden administration works with the commission, I think. Um, I'm going to ask Khan one last question, and then we're going to open it up to the audience for the last uh, 10 minutes or so. Um, Khan, we heard from the, the Portuguese Secretary of State that there's an interest in pushing both digital development uh, in the form of undersea cables like Ellalink, uh, looking at the security of undersea cables, uh, particularly in the global South Africa, a, um, Latin America, etc. And also the idea, which is open to third states, of digital rights, uh, thinking about a charter of digital rights. When you look at, and this is something we address in the report, but I know it's an area of your interest. When you look at digital transformation in the global South, uh, we see a lot of swing states. Uh, and a lot of that is based on um, leadership uh, that is not necessarily completely committed to the ideas of democracy or is somehow um, allured uh, by the possibility of certain surveillance technologies or use of technology to consolidate power. Um, how can Europe uh, influence that environment so that we don't see uh, you know, the adoption and normalization of blanket surveillance technology or oppressive technology in, in countries in, in, in the global south? Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you, Tyson, for that question. I, um, to, to put it bluntly, I think that we in Europe, we have basically neglected the question of the global south um, and in terms of the interface of technology and geopolitics. And on the one hand, I can comprehend that because we are still in the process where we have to, we have to increase competitiveness in a technological realm for ourselves. And it's for us a little bit difficult um, to go now to, to those first countries because we are not acting from a position of power. I mean, not in every area when it comes to the technological area. 
Um, but I, I think if, if we leave them behind, these developing countries in Africa and South America, um, I think this will have disastrous effects for, the, for these countries and for us, and it will fuel the development of digital authoritarianism because um, these digital deciders, these are basically the, 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 battle, the battleground, the battlefield for the US, for China, for Europe. Um, and it is very important also for Europe to bring them back um, to our democratic block. Um, otherwise, we, we can already see that China is very active in these areas. Um, and of course, this will be a balancing act. It will be a balancing act since we are not acting from a position of power. But I think this is the area where the US and the European Union can work together. And now the question, what can we do? What we can do is we can be more, we can do more engagement in, in terms of capacity building, for instance. I mean, when, when you look at the cybersecurity strategy adopted, the European Union cybersecurity strategy adopted in December 2020, it puts more emphasis on, on cyber capacity building, on digital development, which is which goes in the right direction, but we have to do more there in order to offer them also an alternative and not only technological equipment, but also uh, uh, more, we have to promote more our values, more our ideas. Otherwise, those digital deciders, they will go to another block, which will be disastrous for Europe. All right, on that uh, ominous note, uh, we're gonna open it up for questions. Uh, I have the first question in the chat, which is directed at President Ilves and Ms. Giza, which is why are technologies that empower citizens and in turn strengthen the continent not being widely adopted by governments? So uh, President Ilves mentioned that one of the strengths is the public sector as a kind of socializing instrument within Europe. Um, but of course, we know, at least in Germany, that uh, it is not at the vanguard of technology adoption. Um, so uh, perhaps President Ilvis, what do you think? And then uh, Ms. Kiza. Why it's not is beyond me. I mean, in, uh, <clears throat> at least in terms of interactions between citizens and, um, and the government in Estonia, there are three things you can't do digitally, that's getting married, getting divorced and selling real property or immobilium because of uh, uh, the anonymous shell companies. I mean, that's basic, everything else you can do. And we have actually used this to increase citizen participation and do all kinds of things. Uh, why other, I mean, I think, well, one reason why, the main reason why um, other countries don't do it is some kind of uh, Luddite distrust of technology. Um, and I try to argue that in our country, you have far greater transparency than you do in a paper world because you don't know where papers go, but you can always see who's looking at your data in my country, but that's different. It has been slow on the uptake. Mainly you see it in, um, to varying positive degrees in uh, the Nordic countries, um, Finland, Estonia, Denmark, and also the Netherlands. Why it's not like that elsewhere, I have no idea, but certainly Germany is one country that has been uh, most reticent to develop digital public services. And um, I've had all kinds of talks with that over the years uh, with people in Germany, but anyway, it's not happening. Um, but but it's the thing is it's all possible. I mean, what basically you have, you need the, the legal and regulatory framework to enable it and then it can happen. But, but um, this may come down to a bigger problem of the inability of uh, people, of policymakers and uh, people in legislation to understand the nature of the technology and how in fact it is not big brother. Ms. Giza? Yeah, I think the question is not addressed to the right people because Estonia actually is a role model in the adoption of technology for public administration and my party isn't in government, um, not yet at least. 
<laughs> so we are we are asking the same question and not getting any answers. I, I don't know the answer except some sociological considerations on public administrations usually being rather conservative, trying you know to conserve the, the work the workload in order to have control. Um, hierarchies certainly play a role and usually administrations are sort of reluctant to change and, and to novelties. I think in Germany on top of that, um, what my colleague from the Bundestag already uh, mentioned, we have we used to have a very strong traditional, if I can say that, industry, although, I mean, there's no difference really, but having very strong industrial sectors, um, I think there wasn't much of a push so far to go into digital technologies, because um, if you can just simply sit down and, you know, you're fine. Um, there's not really a strong momentum to go to look for something new. But I do think the public, if, if, if I can you know, expand a little bit on that, I, I do think governments should have a stronger role in Europe. I mean, what really distinguishes us from the US is, is a strong social system, strong social values and, and strong governments actually. And I was a little bit surprised that one aspect that wasn't mentioned in your study was investment. Because I mean, what we what we lack in Europe, I don't think it's talent. And, and President Ilva said there are, there are a lot of Estonians and a lot of Germans working in Silicon Valley companies. It's not that we don't have the talent. It's not that we don't have the companies. We simply don't have the capital in this moment. And it's very difficult to expect um, to come at, to expect the capital right now to come from the private sector, because this is really where we are lagging behind in terms of capital. But what is also true, and what an economist like Mariana Mozzucato, for example, has pointed out, that also Silicon Valley's um, inventions are based on public research, on public funded research. I mean, the internet is not something that was invented by Google, basically, that was based on public research. And I think this is something we can learn in Europe. I mean, Google and Facebook make huge amounts of revenue on targeted advertising. That's basically the business model is being, is tracking us, collecting data, being an advertising companies. And then they have some possibilities to invest in all kinds of other sectors, therefore being very innovative. But what we could do in Europe is try to muster the courage to really do huge public investments, maybe in form of a fund of funds. I'm not saying the state should control what exactly we're investing in, although I, although I think some kind of, of industrial policy, for example, on quantum technology on semiconductors wouldn't hurt. But um, let's look at what we were able to do after COVID with the recovery and resilience um, facility that, that you mentioned, Tyson. I mean, that's 750 billion, that, that's a lot of money. Um, and we will have European revenue, European taxes in order to fund that. Why shouldn't we just continue that kind of system and have some kind of European revenue in order to fund innovation in the tax sector? I think public investment is really the thing that could save us in Europe. And the other thing is regulation, because data protection has been mentioned in critical ways from time to time, and I don't agree much with that. The problem we have on data protection in Europe, basically, that it's being enforced against European country companies, but not against US big tech. So um, that's really a competitive advantage for American companies headquartered in Dublin, because the Irish DPA isn't enforcing GDPR against the companies headquartered there. And that's a competitive disadvantage for every company not headquartered in Dublin. And this is something we need to solve. So rather than criticizing the idea of data protection, I think we should use regulation in Europe in order to have um, AI with a purpose, for example, or to have cloud projects with a business model because Gaia X is all fine. But we know that in the second layer now we have a few US companies which are subject to US, US uh, legislation and therefore data being able to be collected and bought by US intelligence agencies and that's not soft. And even the representative from Microsoft, um, Mr. Brinkle, you said that as well, you're subject to US legislation, there's nothing you can do about that. So rather than taking US companies on board for Gaia X, why shouldn't we have public investment in two or three new companies that specialize in big data analysis, big data processing, finalized at artificial intelligence. I think this is the way forward. This is what, what Europe could do, but this is not the job of the Europe Com European Commission. This is the job of the European governments 
of member states um, to, um, to fund such, such kind of idea. The European Commission should coordinate it. But at the July 2020 Council, when the multi-annual financial framework was decided by the European Council, all the investments in digital, Horizon, digital Europe, and so on, were all cut compared um, to the proposal the Commission had made. You know, this, this is where we need to work on, I think. Uh, thanks so much. That was that was perfect. Uh, we did mention our um, uh, the venture capital issue, and in fact, it was one of the top three obstacles identified by stakeholders, along with the lack of first mover advantage and the problems with commercialization of uh, basic research. So it was definitely something that was addressed. We have two questions. I'm going to ask them to ask the questions very, very quickly. Uh, and then we'll get a last response from whichever the panelist wants to take them up. So we have uh, Robin Geibel and Tobias Jatsevsky. Uh, Robin, you're on. Uh, yeah, Joe, uh, very briefly. My question will be what the EU and Germany uh, is actually doing to make it uh, as easy as possible to build and especially scale startups uh, in Europe from a regulatory uh, perspective. Um, I'm just pointing to the very controversial um, reform of uh, startup equity compensation in Germany that's been uh, discussed um, uh, lately. And uh, the reason I'm asking this in terms of artificial intelligence for me as a computer science is mostly because uh, I think that uh, you first need to have a digital business, a digital use case that you can deploy or use uh, machine learning as an instrument on. So it's not, it, to me, it's not a standalone technology. And that's why in traditional established uh, industries, uh, most often these, these projects don't move beyond uh, proof of concept. So I think uh, the focus should, should be on building digital-based businesses. So I'd be interested what the EU in Germany is actually doing to make it easy, as easy as possible to actually scale those. Thank you. That, that sounds like a question for Andreas Steyer. Um, let's take our second question from Tobias and then go back uh, for an answer from Andreas and perhaps somebody else. Yeah, I think the main question is Thank uh, how... Yeah. Tobias, let's get Tobias a question and then go to the audience or and then go back to the panel. Yeah, thanks, Tyson. Uh, very brief question and sorry, um, I, I'm not uh, turning my uh, video on because uh, talking about digital sovereignty and my Wi-Fi just dropped, so um, I'm connected with the authority. Um, question, it's a broader question regarding um, the, uh, the tension, uh, the European tension between uh, the quest for technological autonomy and the simultaneous need for multilateral approaches to tangible solutions. Um, and um, looking at the, the, the new Biden administration, um, let me add the question, if there is, if you see a real window of opportunity for stronger transatlantic cooperation um, in this realm. Thanks. Great question. Um, so let's ask that one to Alejandro because I know he needs to jump. Uh, Alejandro, what's the, what's the potential for work with the Biden administration, uh, specifically given you know, what we saw in the polling about Europe's uh, strategic orientation here, should it go independently or go with the United States, align with the United States? And then to Andreas Steyer about uh, the startup uh, climate and, and regulation around startups in Germany. Thanks uh, for letting me in first. Indeed, I have to go because um, precisely um, my VP is speaking to Secretary Raimondo in a little bit. So uh, uh, it's very pertinent to the question. Uh, no, I think the um, it's early days, obviously, the administration is only getting running. But I think what we can see is uh, certainly much more convergence of ideas and objectives. Um, I think uh, we, we are still at the beginning and we will need to see how all of this is structured going forward. We have proposed creating a new trade and technology council that would, uh, in a way, allow us to, to <clears throat> coordinate much more closely on, on a lot of these issues. Um, we know that uh, we are much less far away than often portrayed in, in most of the key uh, debates and, and frankly if you look at Washington you will see exactly the same debates we are having whether it's on antitrust and market power of big technology platforms or content moderation or privacy. Um, obviously things move at different speed, the political systems are different but um, I think we have some convergence there. I think we are building also convergence on understanding the the, the 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 geopolitical risks of, of, of autocratic use of technology 
and, and what it means uh, for us. We are building convergence on what we need to do in the global south. It's been mentioned before um in terms of uh, providing solid alternatives and frankly i think this is uh, there i would differ a little bit with can for for every um uh, dollar america invests in africa we invest five so i think we're coming from a very strong position to 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 actually uh, do something very meaningful there um so the the short answer is i am i am very optimistic um it will not be automatic because the priorities might be different and we will need to find the right balance that has been mentioned between sovereignty and cooperation. Um, I think both sides will do their industrial policy. This is clear. Um, you know, everyone criticizes uh, EU digital sovereignty, but the US is doing its supply chain reviews. It's strengthening by America. Um, I think the idea here is, is to be able to compare notes and do it in, in a way in which um, we, we create a level playing field for, 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 for a competitive environment where our, our companies on both sides can thrive um, and, and innovate. Uh, and we try to align also on, on, the, on the side of regulation to make sure that we, we, we uphold democratic values, not just on both sides of the Atlantic, but push for it in the multilateral system. Uh, sorry for the long answer. Thanks so much. Long answers are good when they're when they're when they're full of content. So it was perfect. Um, Andrea Steyer, final word to you. Uh, how we've got the Startup Alliance being launched by Portugal. How can Germany make sure it's a full fledged member of the Startup Alliance and and make uh, the ground here in Germany more fertile for for entrepreneurs and startups? I think the, the main question is. Uh, that we should not govern it from the top uh, down to the bottom, but that we should find an atmosphere and create an atmosphere to invite the different stakeholders and uh, to invite them to be part of this regulation process. Because I think uh, we need to invite them to bring in their ideas uh, for the new development. And uh, I always say as an engineer, innovation is nothing new. We did innovation since the past uh, over several hundred years. And we also found, found a way how to interact it and how to provide a certain atmosphere that we have a common ground. And uh, when I look at the European Union, I think each state does uh, a different story, first of all, and has a different uh, regulation. And if we cannot find out a certain way how we uh, harmonize our, our regulation, uh, then I think uh, European, the European Union cannot be a market where a startup can really scale up a certain process. And uh, I can mention a certain way how, how we did it uh, here in, in Germany, how we wanted to do it on AI, uh, that we uh, developed a certain framework. And in this framework, uh, you can establish certain risk assessments. And there are processes how to uh, establish a certain risk assessment uh, to uh, build up then a regulation. And especially when it comes to new innovations, uh, no government knows how this can be regulated. So it has to become, it has to come from the developers on the bottom ground that they give in their ideas and that they build up a, a certain innovative structure. And with this, you can really strengthen our environment. I want to mention one good example uh, here from Germany, the CISPA, and they are also ranked on the top level be, before uh, even, uh, in, on top of, of Stanford, they are number one now ranked on the cybersecurity, and they build up on a nucleus a certain atmosphere where they invite, first of all, the, the researchers, where they uh, invited them and build up a certain atmosphere to build up some startups out of their studies, and they are now scaling it up in order to to show a certain uh, development and to so, to show also a certain way of uh, developing how uh, yeah, how an innovation can be rolled out. And I think when it comes to that point that we are ready to even to be, to be able to scale up our products here, and then I think we are also ready to compete also with uh, Americans and with the Chinese. That's a perfect note to end on. Uh, a, a note of optimism and, and readiness for, for global competition. Um, I'm going to leave it there and thank all of our speakers, uh, uh, Alexandra, Andreas, uh, Alejandro, Khan, and Guido, and of course, President Ilves. 
Uh, President Novus mentioned a, a one project that really stuck with me that the EU should take on, which is building a strong uh, digital security identity. And I think if you look at what we have coming in the kind of legislative pipeline on both sides of the Atlantic and also within NATO, uh, there's going to be a lot of talk about AI and the way that it blurs the, the line between security and civilian uh, domains. And uh, as we think about the G7 summit, as we think about the NATO summit and what will probably be the transatlantic trade uh, and tech council, which will probably meet on the margins, uh, AI with the new regulation, the new package might be a good place to start. But with that, I want to thank all our speakers and all of our participants, and we will uh, see you next time. Thanks everyone.